responsibility, but they're going to federate the, the the running of of um, airspace deconfliction and flight planning below 400 feet, and they're going to give it to third party providers that have to follow certain rules that are in place in order for them to do that. And and so in a sense, what we're doing with weather is kind of the same thing because the FAA realized that they were not gonna be able to keep up or move fast enough to manage that airspace properly. Um, they knew that they would have to come up with a, a new approach in order to keep up with the technology, but also keep up with the requirement to allow this industry to evolve. So when you if you think about the weather component of it, it's really no different, right? Um, is it fair to believe to to put this all on the government weather services to be able to meet all the micro weather data requirements that are going to be needed for us to fully support this industry? No, it's not fair. It really isn't fair. So we have to come up with a different system. And so the system here is the supplemental weather data service provider concept um, is around the same concept of federating weather services out and making them uh, approved sources of data for uh, allowing us to start closing these weather gaps as quickly as possible and to have third party providers do some innovation and 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 close and and do some supporting of these UTM systems and and really trying to drive uh, improvements overall to to make it a more feasible system. So that's really in a big picture what what this is about. And moving to data performance standard is versus certifying instruments is, is just a natural step because that's what the whole UTM industry is doing. That's what the, they're, they're all moving to data performance standards. The FAA is moving to data performance standards in a number of different areas other than weather. So we're not any different than anybody else. We're just following the lead right now of what the FAA is doing, what NASA is doing, where the industry is going. And so the question then becomes, and it's a good thing in my opinion, because it's gonna allow us to open the innovation. It's gonna allow us to take care, take advantage of technology that we would not be able to take advantage of under the, under the certifying instrument system. So what does that mean? All data is on the table. It doesn't mean all data is gonna be accepted. There still has to be a standard. That's what we're writing, a standard, and there has to be means of compliance to go with that standard. In other words, once we get the standard you know, written, the first draft, which, by the way, there's going to be a face-to-face -face meeting up in Syria, up in Rome, New York, on the 31st, the first to the third of June, for the ASTM F38, which is the whole standards body around UAS in general. And then weather is just we're just one group under that that big body. We're going to be meeting in Syri uh, in, in Rome. We're going to have two three-hour sessions uh, on the first, second, and third. And we're going to be taking the latest draft of the uh, of the specification that we've been working on uh, as a group, uh, and the FAA has been involved. And we're going to take that next draft, and we're going to be sitting up in in Rome and adjudicating it and talking through it. So this is an opportunity. Anybody who wants to be involved in this can be involved in this, right? Um, if you're not involved with it in it, it doesn't mean later that people are going to easily be able to stop it. So if you have a concern about it, you need to, you know, be involved in this in this process. Um, and and right now the ASTM F38 Weather Group, you know, you write to me and I'll put you on the group. And everybody that wants to be on it can be on it. And then there's there's going to be a draft coming out before we go down, to, uh, go to Rome, New York, uh, on the first. We should have. An updated draft go out about two weeks before that to everybody to have a chance to look at it and get their inputs in and then come up and, and sit in the face-to-face -face meeting and, and be involved in this, right? So um, the first step is to get the standard written. We're not going to have the means of compliance done uh, from this first round. Um, the way the other groups have worked is they've gotten a standard out. Uh, a, a, we call it a first draft or not a draft, but a first version of the standard. There's a there's a there's a terms of reference that's been written that we're following that was written two years ago, um, and then the next step would be um, the working on the means of compliance, the how, right? The the how and the what and 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 the and the and how we're going to make sure the rules are followed, right? That'll be the second step, 
And part of this is going to happen through research. Part of it's going to be funded by the FAA. I know that, uh, you know, Kevin and Gordy have been working on getting funding for operational improvement programs that would be funding the work, some of the work that's needed to do the testing and demonstration of, of where this is going. Um, NASA's got money that they're putting against this to uh, set up test beds and to do data collection and to inform how how these standards, uh, how, they're, how they're being developed and worked and tested. Um, and then there's gonna have to be some real thinking about how, who's gonna quantify the data that's coming in from these, uh, low, these sources and do the validation and the quantification and the stamping and, and then getting that out in the market. And it's not gonna be all going through the FAA more than likely, it's gonna go, uh, it's gonna be like a, a marketplace that's gonna have this discoverable information that people can pull in that has been validated and calibrated for certain uh, use cases that can be used by the UTMs, the Unmanned Aerial System Traffic Managers who will be uh, doing the flight planning through something called PSUs, which are, I can't remember what, the, what that stands for, but they're also going to be the managers of the advanced air mobility airspace, which is going to be uh, above 400 feet. And, and right now the FAA is working with NASA to figure out, you know, what that's going to look like, the, the, the amalgamation of unmanned aircraft in and manned aircraft in the same airspace, right, um, for these heavy lift cargo drones. Um, and we'll work. We'll work this to uh, set up this the standard and the means of compliance so that a system could be built for this to work, right? And and I think it's a lot of work. It's not going to be simple, but um, everybody will be uh, involved in helping to develop it. So, um, any questions on that before I go to the next slide? Okay. Um, we're also, so the data performance is one piece of, of the pie here, and it it's, is the most significant because it's the one that's going to really open up the innovation to, to close the weather gaps by getting lower cost sensors into the mix and getting data flowing that's it's going to be more ubiquitous. Uh, but the second component of the standards that we're, we're working on is also the concept of E-WINS. And I don't know how many people uh, you know understand what the E-WINS is. But today, if you're a, a certificate holder, an airline, um, you know, a pilot, you have to use approved weather sources in order to fly, right? So the approved weather source today is the National Weather Service Aviation Weather Center uh, is the approved weather source for manned aviation. And third party companies can, um, can provide direct weather services to uh, an airline. You know, I know, you know, folks know this, uh, you know, um, but but they have to go through a process to do that. They have to be um, quanti qualified for that um, through training, through SOPs, through quality assurance uh, training. Um, and, you know, it, what many folks don't understand is that most meteorologists that get their education and their degree in meteorology, they many of them do not really have ever even had a course in aviation weather when they went through. Now, some schools do obviously focus on that, like em Embry Riddle and others, but it's really not something that's taught, like turbulence and icing and low level wind shear and all that. So, companies that um, take on this responsibility have to build that training, get their forecasters qualified to do that. And, and then they can then support an operator, but that operator has to also certify that they, that the uh, weather company or the weather entity has followed all the procedures that the FAA set out. And then they have to put that on their certificate of operation. And did you know that once a, a, a private weather company or an, a third party is on that certificate, that operator cannot use National Weather Service products? Because again, the reason is, is they don't want uh, misinformation coming from different sources that that are are, are in conflict. So you have to have a single Don. approach for that. So you need to wrap it up, Don. So what we're doing here is that that is not something that's going to work well in the aviation industry going forward because there's so many operators and so many OEMs. So what we're recommending is that 
rather than putting that onus on the uh, certificate holder, it's going to become uh, the onus of the third party weather provider to meet those standards. And then there'll be a mechanism in place to certify or validate that they're meeting those standards. And we haven't yet figured out, is that an FAA responsibility? Is the FAA going to outsource that to a third party responsibility? But that should also now open up the spigot for uh, private weather companies to be more involved in aviation weather, which again is a good thing because it'll drive innovation. And the last area that we're focusing on is interface standards. And you know, we talked about this earlier. There's a lot of different types of weather Don, data. Don, we're out of time. Okay, let me just finish this one statement. There's well, let, you got 10 seconds. Weather. All right, there's a lot of different weather data types out there, but the community doesn't want to play with our weather data. They want it to be in GEO, JSON, or JSON format because that's what they're using as their standard. So we're going to be talking about making sure that uh, when we integrate and operate with UTMs that we're using a standard data format that um, that they're used to dealing with. So that's what I have, Ralph. Thank you very much, Don. I appreciate that. Let me wrap this up. First, I want to thank everybody on the panel for having been here and contributed, and I appreciate all of you listening. I think the message uh, that we have is today, over the last you know several decades, we have generated a significant amount of data in the meteorology business. But because of policy guidance, a lot of that data isn't operationally used and we continue to hang on to human observers, in particular from pilots. That's where we are today. Tomorrow, folks, we need to change our policy. We need to incorporate all of the data we have available. We need to use non-traditional sources and cost-effective sensors. We need to improve the training of our operators in weather and our decision makers. We need to provide that data in usable and desirable formats, and we need to increase the amount of data providers that are out there. Thank you very much. Hope uh, you enjoyed it. Now we have precisely zero seconds between one panel and the next, and so we have to instantaneously transport one in and the other out. <laughs> And I have to get their their uh, their presentation up. Uh, unless Gary, are you were you planning on driving, or do you want me to drive? Okay, very well. Yep, stand by. Yep, yep, yep. I... I guess that's big. I'm going to do a quick, real quick introduction. Hopefully online works because that's our first two presenters. This is going to be a little different than a lot of presentations just because it's going to be very broad. This is the first time we really discussed how weather or opportunities for weather to reduce emissions. And we're doing this because both for the FAA and as people know, this administration is really pushing for reducing emissions affecting global cha weather changes, things like that. So there may be opportunities if there's good ideas that get presented to actually go out and get some funding for research or ideas to pursue to reduce emissions. And obviously there's a business case right off because typically reduced emissions re means you're burning less fuel. So there's a benefit there to the person who's actually flying if they're getting more efficient with their fuel. So we're going to start out with NCAR, Jason Craig, and um, well, NCAR is Jason Craig, and then Tony Trainey from Virginia Tech are going to be the first two presenters, and they're going to have kind of a tag team talking about a WIDIC program and both the um, safety benefits as well as what was saved in fuel. So I'm going to hand it off to online. Matt's giving a thumbs up, so I guess you guys are there. Let me make sure I'm you're muted there. All right, thank you, Gary. Uh, I'm Jason Craig from NCAR. Uh, we're here to give you a very quick, brief overview of the Romeo demonstration, um, which was a where we were uplinking uh, convective weather information in the ocean. Uh, Gary, can you next slide? Um, so, what was the Romeo demonstration? I'll give a quick what it looked like. This was a iPad demonstration where we were sending the cloud top heights shown here in grayscale um, and what we call the convective diagnosis oceanic in color um, and these two products would give pilots uh, an overview of 
the clouds and weather up ahead in um, basically the oceanic domain. Um, and here we see the uh, aircraft's uh, flight route in magenta. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, so the demonstration really was we were trying to uh, explore how the feasibility of uplinking this convective weather information in remote regions, um, exploring how pilots would use this information while in route, uh, as well as getting the information to airline dispatch uh, and artsies, um, and how the pilots would interact with those, uh, the, the, those people. But basically, what today we're going to dive into deep is the benefits that providing the updated weather information into the flight deck can provide. Um, and that's where Tony Trani is going to come in and talk about the benefits analysis that was coming out of this demonstration. Um, the next slide here. So I'm doing the brief overview. Uh, the cloud top height is a in-car derived product from satellite and model data. It updates every 10 minutes. Um, and it's basically just estimating the cloud top height information. Um, and then to supplement that information, we have the convective diagnosis oceanic, which is detecting convective hazard areas, generally within cloud. Um, and it's a hazard indicator between zero and six. It's derived from lightning model and satellite. And values over two are where convective is likely, and over three is where we're seeing lightning or overshooting tops present. And the reason we have the two products together is it better characterizes convective storms. One shows you where the cloud cover is, and the other shows you where the actual convective and hazard areas are. Uh, next slide there. So the Romeo demonstration, we were actually sending th these two products out into um, US airline pilots cockpit. Um, and to do that, in these remote regions, we need to, to reduce the bandwidth. Uh, so the CTH product, we made contours and even flight levels between 320 and 400. Uh, and then we would turn them into polygons and send that up into the flight deck where they would then be displayed. And we do that with a CDO product. We make contours of the values of two, three, four, and above five. And so this, made a significant reduction in the bandwidth that would send up into pilots, which was allowing us to even make this demonstration possible. Um, the flight routes, of course, were uh, CONUS Airlines to and from international destinations um, over the oceans or to South America. And, and on their display, they would be able to see their own route um, and improve their situational awareness of what weather was up ahead for them. Um, if we go to the next slide. So here we see the demonstration display again, which I can go into a little more detail now that we've got the overview. Um, this is the same display, but with the pilots, uh, they had the ability to turn it into dark mode, um, which is what we're seeing here. Um, and you can really see now how not just the cloud top height, which is in grayscale, shows widespread cloud cover here, but where it really highlights convective areas. Um, and this is key for allowing that pilot to see areas that they likely may need to avoid before they will see them with their onboard radar. Um, and then the next slide, I think is my last slide for this. And this is a very complex slide, but really this is an overview of the whole demonstration, which was us um, in car processing the satellite and model data, developing and generating the products. Um, uh, our airlines were Delta, American, and United showing the product on their EFB tablets in the cockpit. Um, and then we had our data providers of GoGo and Panasonic providing that data to the cockpits. Um, and BCI preparing and providing the actual demonstration um, the display that was loaded onto the EFBs. Um, and of course, our sponsor was the FAA's Weather Technology in the Cockpit Program, providing the funding for this. And then here, our final partner was the Virginia Polytechnical Institute, or Virginia Tech, uh, doing the benefits analysis, which is where we're going to see how providing this weather information can reduce fuel costs or fuel usage, and therefore greenhouse, um, by reducing the uh, aircraft's divergence and basically getting that information quicker to the pilots and earlier and how that can benefit.
So I will turn this over to Tony Traney now to dive into that benefits analysis. Tony, you're muted. We're not hearing you yet. Still nothing, Tony. Okay, let me see. Now I think I hear you. Okay, so this is uh, this is work uh, from uh, Dr. Sadi, Nick Hines, uh, Amy, and myself. So let's go to the next slide here. So. I'm just going to describe briefly the benefits analysis here. Of course, we want to thank, uh, if we go to the next slide, the FA for providing funding uh, for this effort. And again, these are the folks. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, basically, this study uh, spans three different uh, uh, ideas. You know, the first one was to get pilot survey, pilot surveys that were done about 101 surveys uh, around the time frame of August 2019. Then we also did some statistical analysis and weather deviation analysis to understand how pilots are going to be actually going around the weather using these uh, Romeo displays. That was done in September 2019. And then finally, the, the simulation based effort and the injury analysis uh, around 2020 in June. There was a, an added task, you know, where we actually did some improvements to the global oceanic model, but I'm not going to cover that in this particular presentation. So let's go to the next slide. So the product that we use here is a uh, model that we have developed for the FA called the Global Oceanic Model. Uh, this is a complex model that basically models the aircraft uh, flight trajectory, uh, models the aircraft every five seconds and, and you know, predicts uh, fuel consumption, travel time, uh, levels of service in case you have uh, routes, you know, predefined routes like the North Atlantic uh, organized track system and so on. Uh, we use basically BADA 3 and BADA 4 models. And this is again a complex model that we have the logic to be able to go around the weather as well as detecting conflicts, you know, with other aircraft. Let's go to the next slide. I think uh, Jason has done a good job at showing you the Romeo display, so I'm not going to say much about this, except that these displays are being used in the cockpit by the pilots to be able to avoid uh, the weather. So let's go to the next slide. Um, overall, you know, when we did the survey here, we found that uh, out of 110 pilot surveys, 95% of the pilots perceived that the Romeo uh, product, you know, in this case, provided uh, equal or improved situational awareness. And it turns out that, you know, the surveys were done randomly, but 54% of the flights that, that actually the pilots that took surveys did perform a weather deviation. So what is important here is the second bullet, which is that Romeo provided an additional, at least an additional 10 minutes of additional time to be able to plan a weather deviation. And you will see in, in the follow up slides that this is important. Um, let's go to the next slide here. So to put things in concept, if we can put this in motion, please, if you click on the on the slide to be able to. Oops. So it looks like that slide. Uh, it has a, a a play button. So if you don't mind just playing the, the slide there, it's actually an animation of a Boeing 777-300ER uh, that flies uh, from Argentina to uh, Miami. And if we can get the video here, it will be uh, wonderful, but I don't know if it's going to actually play. But this turns out to be a 240, uh, mi uh, 240 nautical mile detour or deviation around the Amazon. So normally, uh, you know, probably this slide may not play here. I guess uh, we have some issue with the with the information that is behind the scenes. But but anyway, I think that uh, we can probably move on if we cannot get the video uh, you know, playing. Normally, if you hit on the on the button there, it should play the video, but uh, I don't know why. If you just click once, uh, it should be able to play the video. Well, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Don't worry about it. This was a, a 240 mile um, detour in the Amazon uh, basin. And basically what you have there is a very large detour in very hostile terrain because there is really no good weather there. So what we decided to do to examine 18,000 of these uh, long range flights, and we basically derive, if you hit the, the, the key, uh, 
we we start establishing, you know, historically how is that pilots are going to avoid uh, weather in general. We found that using these uh, Romeo displays, you know, the CDO product especially, uh, we wanted to characterize how much distance, you know, pilots were able to traverse, you know, in this kind of weather. Uh, so if you hit the key, uh, any key in the keyboard, you will see event number two, where we have now a pilot encountering a little bit more rougher weather, and we were trying to characterize how is that pilots are going to be able to traverse that weather. If you hit once more the key, or a couple of times, you will be able to see now one more time uh, that there is event number four, where now pilots are encountering these red areas, which obviously are very uh, important convective weather events that pilots are going to be in general avoiding. So using 18,000 oceanic flights, we were able to figure out how close pilots are able to get to the weather and what are the avoidance uh, maneuvers that they do around. So if we go to the next slide here, we will be able to see that uh, we program all of this information into this global oceanic model. And now we have a, a simulation model, a very detailed simulation model that models the aircraft trajectory every five seconds in general on how pilots are going to avoid the weather. And you can see on the right hand side there, using the Romeo CDO contours, you know, how different trajectories that are prescribed in the model. And of course, the model has the intelligence based on the 18,000 oceanic flights that we investigated to decide what is the most likely trajectory that this pilot is going to follow to avoid that weather. So this is uh, basically what we did. If we go to the next slide, uh, we may be able to see actually the the reason why Romeo is considered to be important here in the context of compared to onboard radar weather uh, information. So here we have an airplane that is encountering some weather there over hostile terrain, maybe the Amazon or the intertropical convergence zone. And if you look at here, we, weather normally the onboard weather radar is good for maybe 20 minutes ahead of time. That's what the pilots tell us. So in this case, it prescribes a, a detour maybe to the right. Now, if you hit the key, the next key, you will see that now with Romeo, uh, the pilot starts realizing that the weather is actually better probably to make a detour to the left because you are providing an additional 10 minutes of look ahead uh, horizon uh, time. If we hit one more, uh, the keyboard, you will see that now with 40 minutes look ahead of time, you will be able to see now, you know, probably embedded weather that is out, uh, out there in front of you. And one more time, we will have a 60 minute look ahead time. So here, what we are saying here is that basically Romeo, according to what the pilots told us, is that it provides a much more uh, better picture, a situational awareness to be able to plan these uh, weather detours, you know, especially in the ocean or in hostile terrain where you don't have very good weather products there. If we go to the next slide here, we will see that we perform some simulation analysis uh, thousands of flights over different types of weather. You know, again, all of these are weather days that were picked from real scenarios, you know, that NCAR provided to us. And we found that on average, you know, the fuel consumption uh, could be reduced about 87 kilograms uh, for all of the flights that were affected by the weather uh, events, including those that actually were affected by those weather events because you have a domino effect. You know, once a plane starts deviating due to weather, sometimes that deviation is going to affect other flights. If you look at only the flights that were deviated from weather here, we found that about 115 kilograms uh, were actually saved per flight, could have been saved using the Romeo displays, which are, accounts for about 363 uh, greenhouse uh, gases, you know, emissions there in kilograms as well. So, you know, we have a lot of these uh, statistics. We can show you that the presentation is short here. So let's go to the next slide here just to show you uh, some information. So we simulated using the global oceanic model and every dot that you see on the screen represents a uh, lateral deviation that was done due to weather. And in this case, this is the onboard radar scenario where we have only a 20 minute look ahead of horizon. And you can see that there is about 683 deviations for this day of uh, that we simulated with the actual traffic, you know, for specific days of the year. If we hit the next uh, the keyboard here, we will see that with Romeo enabled scenarios, uh, we predicted 554 deviations due to weather. Again, because pilots can plan these deviations much better, you have a, 30, a 10 minute look ahead, uh, you know, benefit there or a 30 minute look ahead horizon. 
And you know, a 19% reduction in the weather deviation is important also for the air traffic uh, controllers. So not only you are saving fuel and greenhouse gases that you are producing, but you are also making life probably better for those oceanic controllers uh, in terms of the communication bandwidth as well. Let's go to the next slide here. And you know, this is just a slide that basically summarizes the percent of the deviation, the weather deviation maneuvers that were uh, again calculated or estimated using uh, the, our global oceanic model in all of the regions that we simulated. Again, you can see that the majority of the traffic here is uh, Atlantic traffic and uh, the oceanic area around the New York airspace was uh, greatly benefit, you know, a, a reduction of 10.3 percent in the number of lateral deviation maneuvers. In the next slide, I can show you the you know, also that we concluded that, you know, we look at historical data on how injuries and airframe uh, effects are going to be happening due to these weather events. We look at the app herald uh, database and, you know, previous studies that the FAA had commissioned mentioned that a serious injury is around a million dollars and a minor injury is about $31,000. So we use this information and then we look at the number of times that pilots will be able to save potentially encountering weather and we make some uh, projections. If you go to the next slide, I can show you the projections in terms of the benefit for injuries. In this case, if you look at the very last uh, uh, bullet, it's around five and a half million dollars in injury avoidance or about 20 percent reduction in the exposure to severe uh, convective weather events we believe uh, based on the analysis that we've done. And again, there are three reports to showcase this. And then for the simulated base uh, uh, benefit analysis, we encounter or concluded that about $15 million. Uh, and by the way, this is when the fuel price was about $189 per gallon. So you can see that these numbers would be much higher today. Uh, could be saved using the, that would be kind of the benefit of the Romeo uh, weather product, you know, that uh, was prototyped and developed by uh, NCAR and others. So I'm just going to stop here just to see if there's any questions uh, about this. And I think maybe, Jason, you're going to take it back, is right? So why don't you go ahead and uh, continue this? By the way, I mentioned, I forgot to mention that if you want to know more about this global oceanic model that we developed for the FAA under a next door contract, you know, you can contact me or uh, Nick Hines. Thank you. Jason, go ahead. Thank you, Tony. Um, so now I'm going to hear a little echo. Um, so now I'm going to go and talk about a new system called the Global Weather Notification System. Um, and what I'm going to highlight here is what Tony said that the pilots uh, reported that the getting that weather information, the Romeo information, into the cockpit gave them a, an additional 10 minutes of knowing about the weather before their onboard radar saw it. Um, so here we see the Romeo display and we're highlighting here um, some weather and what uh, a particular aircraft's onboard ra radar coverage shows. So the idea here is how do we give these pilots that 10 minutes that, of additional time to know about weather if they're not looking at their um, EFB weather tablet or if they're not aware of the tablet um, and they're not using it all the time, or even if they're unable to get bandwidth into the cockpit to get this weather product into their EFB. So next slide. Um, so what the system that I'm going to talk about, the Globe Weather Notification System, does is it takes the weather products that we're feeding it, and it looks ahead for the aircraft and for the pilot. It does the look ahead for you um, and here in the ocean we're using a 32 minute uh, window highlighted here in red and we're going to see that there is weather directly ahead of this aircraft and create what we're calling a notification text message um, which is shown at the bottom um, the important parts of it is at the end there it says moderate convection ahead and the location of that convection and it also is giving the cloud top height um, height at that location of the convection so this is what the system is doing um, and what it does is it runs this data through it for aircraft without the pilot needing to be looking at that weather product himself or herself. Um, so the next slide, please. Uh, the weather notification system is anticipating whether any aircraft will soon encounter or be in close proximity to observe or 
predicted adverse weather conditions. And how it does that is it takes the aircraft and positions and current location, um, and it's going to project it forward in time. It's going to calculate a qualitative and categorical severity based on the weather grid that's been given, um, like, like, like moderate, severe. Uh, the next slide, please. And what it does, if it does have this it's going to create a text message, um, but this system runs on the ground. We're not going to send. It doesn't require the weather products to be sent up to the aircraft um, using a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but what are these notifications for? They're really short. They're designed to give the pilots a very quick heads up um, of notification about adverse weather before they get to it. So in the oceanic region, we're talking about giving them a 30 minute look ahead or even 45 minutes potentially and saying, hey, there's convection up ahead. And that's it. That's all we're saying. You know, they, th then it's up to the pilot to decide what they want to do with that information. Um, and so we find the system as a novel way to present weather to a pilot. Um, they don't need to be looking at it while they're in route potentially and only draw that pilot's attention to adverse weather when it's predicted to be in their aircraft's path. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we also uh, used this system in a demonstration with turbulence in the CONUS. Um, and here we're seeing uh, an act the demonstration display for this. Um, and on the left is the pop-up notification that a pilot could receive about turbulence. Um, and here we're just saying, you know, the aircraft's location and light turbulence in the area ahead. And if that pilot would click on that message, there's a little more info. It automatically would pop up with the um, display of the actual turbulence product on the right. That would pop up and then they could see the turbulence that was predicted or in this case, this is a GTG in the Nowcast product and showing turbulence up ahead. Um, on the left, you have a vertical cross section. And so this pilot would see that there's turbulence below them and, and coming up ahead. And on the right, they have that horizontal view that just shows general widespread light turbulence. Um, and that's all our, the system is really trying to do is give them that quick heads up. Hey, there's turbulence up ahead. And then the pilots may not do anything with that information, or maybe they may not have known and they just put the fast and seatbelt sign on. There's lots of very simple, easy things. But the idea is that this is a quick way to get weather into that cockpit. Um, and the next slide, please. Here we see it running with Romeo um, and you know it's hard to demonstrate the system other than just a text notification but here we're showing how the system tracks all available aircraft that you process through it. That's how um, the power of running the system on the ground is you can run as much aircraft as you want through it. Um, and then I think the next slide is my last slide. So you know we've tested this with the oceanic convective information and the GTG nowcast turbulence information but this this system can run with almost any weather type that uh, we have um, forecasts or nowcast for um, and it can track almost any type of aircraft as well um, the the key uh, implementation options that are very hard are getting that notification text into the cockpit that's the harder part um, so we do have a meeting um, for how to get this system and as well as the, C the uh, Romeo products, the CTH and CDO products, um, get them to more operational state. Uh, we have a meeting with industry to talk about how they can obtain these two. Um, this in just a month here in May 24th, uh, there's the web, web page URL for more information. Um, there's lots of questions that come out when I present this system. Uh, so here's some other things that can come out of it, which is a pilot may need to register their flight if they're not on an airline or their GA pilot type. They would register their own flight saying they want the notifications. Um, and the way to display the text could be very different by GA or airlines, such as if you have an EFB and you have internet connectivity, you can do the full suite where you get the notification and then you get the weather product you can see, or potentially just getting the text notification alone. Um, so that's my quick presentation on this system. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, because uh, to be fair to all the briefers, we'll do questions at the end. So I want to go to James Olden, who's next. This is going to be an Air Force presentation, and he'll explain that. And then so hopefully if you have any questions, you'll remember if there's time. But I don't want to rush. Everybody's put some time into their presentations. Thank you.
Great, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Frosnack, Mr. Steiner for the invitation as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Gardner. Uh, appreciate being here. Um, my name is James Olden and I'm here representing uh, Mr. Bert Guerrero, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Operational Energy. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a, a meteorologist uh, or a scientist, but uh, I was a, a C-17 pilot in the Air Force when I was on active duty. I also flew the C-21 Learjet, so large and small aircraft. Uh, and I'm currently the uh, Division Chief for Current Operations uh, for Operational Energy down at the Pentagon. So, um, yeah, how's that? A little better? <laughs> All right. Um, so, a little background on, on operational energy uh, defined in 10, Title 10 U.S. Code 2926 as the energy required to move, train, and sustain military forces. Um, so from our perspective, um, our mission is to improve combat capability, but looking at it through an energy lens and seeing how we can improve energy usage uh, across the Air Force. Uh, the, the office was established back in 2010 after uh, the services sustained over 3,000 casualties between 2003 and 2007, transporting and securing logistics supply routes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, Congress wanted the DOD and the service components to look at how to de-risk um, those operations, getting fuel and water to forward operators. Um, so, I mean, if you if you look at it from from that perspective, when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, we we basically had uh, in a relatively uncontested environment. But looking into the future, if we had to transport fuel forward to uh, the South China Sea or uh, across Europe, the, the risk increases exponentially. Um, so as a force, we as in the Air Force, we consume about 2 billion gallons of aviation fuel per year. So when we kind of use operational energy and aviation fuel interchangeably. Um, so that's kind of on the same order of magnitude as a, a US airline. Um, it's about 45% of energy use DOD wide and about 85% of Air Force energy usage. So when you when you think about the opportunity there, it really, from a climate perspective, it becomes the some of the most cost effective ways to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions lie in, in reducing our reliance on on aviation fuel. Um, and even a small, you know, incremental change can make a, a big difference uh, with with that kind of budget. Uh, one example of uh, of how we, um, well, one of one of the ways we've looked at reducing fuel use is through precision fuel planning, and I think it's uh, it's it's kind of uh, it makes sense that you you burn fuel to to carry fuel. So if you're if the pilot if the aircraft commander is adding another ten thousand pounds of fuel on his on a five hour sortie, uh, we look at about three percent of that is burned just to carry the extra weight. So you're talking about an extra 1,500 pounds burned to carry that extra 10,000 pounds. So in looking at the data across our heavy aircraft fleet from B-52s to C-17s to KC-135s, uh, we saw a, a strong, you know, significant correlation between uh, aircraft landing weight, uh, landing in excess of the fuel required to complete the mission with unscheduled maintenance actions, specifically uh, looking at landing gear. And that was also correlated with a um, with about a two percent change in aircraft ability. Sorry, aircraft availability. One of our metrics that we measure readiness by. And so, when you look at at a aging aircraft fleet um, and aircraft that are in high demand for uh, cargo transport and aerial refueling, uh, that two percent can make a huge a huge difference. And then some of the cost savings numbers on here, uh, those are based on uh, this one in particular is based on uh, about a 2.5 percent demand reduction and uh, we looked at the cost of aviation fuel based on a five-year rolling average of the defense logistics agency uh, standard rate so what does all, all this have to do with with weather and and climate um well similar to uh to jason and, and tony's uh briefing we're looking at ways to in, improve uh, the situational awareness of both um both the pilots in the cockpit and our flight managers. 
and so one of the one of the products we looked at was uh, developed by uh, Dr. Tom Reynolds and his team at MIT Lincoln Lab. And they worked with the uh, 557th uh, weather uh, weather wing at Offutt Air Force Base, uh, and they pulled data from uh, cloud tops, lightning strike data, and uh, Air Force weather uh, Air Force weather models to uh, use data fusion and machine learning to build a synthetic product that can provide um, better weather situational awareness um, in areas that would not otherwise be be covered. Um, so you, you you talk about I've I've heard a lot about adding uh, adding sensors and adding uh, facilities, uh, which becomes cost prohibitive when you want to get the kind of coverage that you need for global operations. And the initial use case for this was to uh, look at unmanned uh, missions, and uh, and decrease the number of weather cancellations. But we also see a, a strong use case for it. Um, with our uh, flight managers at the 6, 618th Air Operations Center at uh, Scott Air Force Base. Um, so our flight managers out there, the FAA certified flight managers, um, and they're scheduling missions for 1,100 aircraft globally, um, representing our Mo Mobility Air Force's fleet, uh, which alone is, is responsible for burning about 60% of Air Force fuel use. Uh, so they did an operational test with the uh, Weather Operations Directorate and Flight Management Division uh, to uh, examine the feasibility of of using it and providing better uh, flight following from the flight managers to the to the uh, air crew and, and provided some feedback. Um, so I know I was talking to Ralph earlier. I know he's got some background there and uh, probably other folks in the room who might know even more about this. Um, but it's just one of the one of the uh, tools that that we advocate for um, from a policy governance and oversight perspective. Yeah, I paid for that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get some uh, some good use out of it. No, Ralph was just saying uh, it's based on uh, on a model, and you need a good quality model in order to provide good good quality data for the for the operator. Um, and then, uh, so so reducing fuel use uh, has has mission impact, also re uh, strongly related to climate emissions and uh, and climate change and, and dealing with the effects of climate change is a priority for the administration. Um, Executive Order 14008 highlights that uh, climate is central to uh, national defense and, and for planning and operations. And uh, the Department of Defense uh, has published their climate adaptation plan and climate risk analysis, and the services will be following with their own climate action plans. The Army has already published theirs, the Air Force Climate Action Plan will be forthcoming where uh, the Air Force will be highlighting some goals and objectives uh, related to both climate adaptation and climate mitigation. So as we as you reduce the logistics requirements um, uh, for for operations, you also provide flexibility for um, for those operating in austere environments, um, a lot of environments that are going to be affected by climate change and rising uh, rising sea levels. Uh, just to uh, to um, kind of summarize, um, we see we see weather as a really a critical enabler to um, to improve the efficiency of of operations and uh, and restore con or provide confidence in our um, in the flight planning that we provide to air crews and and the flight following that we provide to our global mobility mission. Um, and so, as we see, as we see the the mission impact imp improve from some of these uh, some of the initiatives that we're pursuing, and um, and realizing cost savings, we're also trying to put those cost savings back into energy operational energy investments um, that will also have second and third order impacts on mitigating greenhouse gases and um, 
and uh, reducing the demand for uh, for aviation fuel. Thanks, James. Our next speaker is remote. We kind of bounce back and forth. Uh, this is from NASA. Um, Hawk, I'm not quite sure how, uh, of course, being put Codner, and he has to sympathize with last names. I don't know what two letters, how you say it. He is the opposite. But um, Hawk, are you there? Yes. Uh, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Yep. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to first uh, thank the FPAFW committee for inviting me to talk about a few NASA's efforts in beta analysis and also our uh, collaborative work with the UAM community. Uh, just before that, um, since this panel session is about the role of radar in enhancing aviation efficiency and reducing carbon emission, I also want to share with you my past research efforts uh, in this area. So next slide, please. Uh, this figure plus the worldwide wind optimal routes. Uh, we did studies that show that, you know, actually frame wind optimal routes uh, use both time and fuel savings for each individual freight. We have also examined a possible um, numerical approach and, uh, excuse me, running the algorithms on different hardware uh, and investigate how to improve the um, this computational speed uh, in generating this um, wind optimal uh, energy efficient routes for air traffic at a um, national and global uh, level. So we actually use the resources of a supercomputer at NASA AMS. Um, we also won this um, uh, similar computation on multiple commercially available computers. So I believe um, uh, this work was actually done more than five years ago. So back then, uh, you know, cloud computing was not that um, not as popular as now. So basically, what we show is that in the absence of uh, uh, the special privilege on uh, a supercomputer, really a cluster of commercially available computer uh, could, you know, provide a feasible approach uh, for national and global air traffic system studies. Uh, in addition to that, we also leverage the quantum computing capability aims and explore new programming techniques that allows um, uh, strategic conflict formulation of wind optimal trajectories uh, so that we allow this formulation to be programmed in the D-Wave uh, quantum annulus. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this green polygon shown here are the predicted airspace regions favorable to persistent contrast formation worldwide. Uh, I think for a, a, a day in winter, uh, not 24 hours, but probably an instance um, during a winter day. We study how to generate wind optimal trajectories that minimize uh, the total climate impact of aircraft uh, in terms of um, a, a climate metric called global warming potential. Um, also, um, that that um, uh, climate metric also consider several types of aircraft emissions. And at the same time, uh, we also avoid the regions of uh, airspace that facility uh, persistent control formation. We also look at you know, how to analyze and minimize the total climate for aircraft emission and persistent controls and trade off the energy efficiency and the trajectory design, you know, depending on uh, you know, different environmental objective, say, you know, uh, at the end of you know, uh, different time horizons, say 25, 50, and 100 years, uh, respectively. So this route design, um, uh, you know, they can be evaluated with respect to you know how really a hypothetical tax on control production could influence the stakeholders' willingness to redefine their so-called you know crow and crow you know optimal cruise trajectory. Uh, so if you um, are interested in this topic, you know, please um, email me. Uh, I could provide you more details for this work. So next, I will uh, I will talk about uh, my current focus at NASA. Next slide, please. Uh, so just some background for UAM. Uh, I think this morning we heard uh, a lot about low altitude weather, um, but just in case you are not very familiar with this uh, topic, so NASA is conducting a far-term um, concept exploration uh, for user-defined air transport system in urban areas. So this is aimed to meet the potential demands from UAS and future operations of uh, EVTOLs. 
Uh, we envision that this future urban air transport system will be designed uh, for minimum disruption of existing airspace operations and most importantly, uh, the urban residents. Um, this chart at the lower left um, shows the UAM framework, uh, the current UAM frameworks and barriers that can be found in NASA's UAM CONOPS uh, document. So I have uh, also highlighted here the weather elements in each UML level uh, that needs to be addressed. At uh, UML for, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, this uh, level four, so medium is, is defined as medium density that's characterized by as, you know, hundreds of simultaneous operations over a single metropolitan area. Um, you know, medium capacity um, includes low visibility operations and assumes that uh, either modify or entirely new uh, new flavors uh, needs to be implemented in at least, you know, portions of this airspace to enable safe operations um, in a wide range of uh, weather conditions. And also at the lower right, these are the list of efforts that were planned by NASA's um, you know, advanced air mobility community, uh, you know, AAM, you know, community integration working group. So I'm just borrowing um, uh, part of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the slides that they have. Uh, this is uh, basically planned, this activity is planned for, you know, overcoming the weather barriers. And um, NAS, uh, Nancy uh, Mendonca is the lead of this uh, working group. So next, I will provide a brief overview of the collaborative weather efforts done in the last couple of years. Um, that we, we, we did this with ANCA, you know, uh, several uh, SBIR companies and also my group. Um, these projects were actually funded by NASA's ATMX project. So this slide provides an overview of this, uh, the previous work, uh, this ongoing research uh, partnership and also weather related activities uh, that were planned for my group. So mainly there are three major uh, research and development areas, UAM weather data support, operational impact translation, and impact analysis. Uh, the motivation for ANCAS weather support to NASA is to um, evaluate the um, existing weather guidance products, uh, both observation and work focus, uh, with uh, regard to its ability of supporting NASA's UAM efforts. So this will require understanding the unique aspects of UAM uh, compared to current helicopter and GA operations in the low uh, altitude airspace. So ANCAS analysis were actually done for 25 major uh, metropolitan area in the US. Uh, Matthias Steiner uh, was the PI for this project and I was the TM. Uh, so we have um, uh, the final reports um, so if uh, you know, let me know, you know, let us know if you are interested in, you know, they are available. And in addition, ANCA also provided uh, us, you know, NASA several set of weather data uh, for simulation of typical weather efforts to UAM traffic at uh, DFW, uh, New York, San Francisco Bay Area, and also uh, LA metro area. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, actually, particular for the DFW data set, uh, we use it for generating weather scenarios uh, along NASA's UAM um, experimental routes uh, for testing the UAM weather data connection uh, with NASA's uh, ATMX uh, test bed. So as well as for the, um, uh, the, the UAM weather translation model, um, I think we probably will all agree that you know, in a similar um, manner to air traffic operation, so the war weather um, data uh, they must be translated into uh, actual, you know, weather impacts, so so that they they become um, you know, useful and operational, uh, uh, you know, relevant. So we funded SBIR to AFMAT um, in, and we the objective of this task is to model the potential impacts of various uh, weather phenomena such as wind uh, on UAM operations. Uh, we also um, uh, so one part of my collaborative. Uh, efforts with German Aerospace Center, or DRR, uh, is to, to do some, um, to make use of this anchor weather data and, and, and weather translation model for, um, uh, you know, impact analysis, right? Uh, so we, so the current um, objective of this test is, you know, to, to understand potential of current weather data and, and, and its limitation for modeling and, and mitigation of weather impact um, for UAM uh, in Europe and also in the US. So in the US, uh, high resolution web page refresh, uh, also known as the HER, 
uh, was actually recom recommended by Anchor as one of the most uh, suitable uh, uh, weather port that currently available to the public for UM uh, application. Uh, so, but a bit earlier this morning, I also, uh, uh, you know, heard about the, the HEMS port. That there could be, you know, another um, a viable port that for uh, supporting UAM uh, research. So, uh, but but for the HER data, the HRR data has a great resolution of three kilometer. So that's uh, probably uh, a bit too coarse. But we still want to understand, you know, how applicable. Uh, her is to strategic planning of long longer, you know, UAM trips. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. Yep. So, yeah, thanks. So this figure shows the overview of UAM uh, impact analysis study. The focus will be on weather and aircraft uh, aircraft uh, freight noise. The anchor data set uh, we use it as so, so that. The anchor data will serve as a disturbance models or input. We also utilize AFMAX uh, weather impact constraint and rules to translate the potential impact of weather um, uh, phenomena such as wind and, and stress, etc., on UAM operations. Uh, and also understand uh, the implication um, of weather uncertainty on UAM. So the wind data samples provided anchor were used to quantify the range of uh, wind, uh, wind variation for driving UAM aircraft guidance, um, really without knowing the performance of some of these uh, system parameter, uh, such as you know, navigation accuracy. So UAM flight intents were actually derived for um, Monte Carlo simulation uh, using the uh, developed aircraft guidance and the wind data. So um, you know, some of the preliminary results can be found in my 2020 AI, AI AA aviation paper. So next slide, please. Uh, this slide just show the input data and the models uh, for the uh, impact analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this slide summarizes the preliminary results and output of the impact analysis study uh, we, we did for DFW. Uh, this figure on the left shows the translation process of wind hazards. Um, basically, we, we uh, potentially this could um, this block could serve as a uh, you know building rock or component for developing a UAM uh, uh, weather SDSP. So on the right hand side, this figure shows an example of wind optimal UAM corridor and the associated trajectory based operation volume. Uh, so this was created, you know, utilizing the uh, perturbation of the UAM aircraft trajectory following the developed aircraft guidance command in the area. Uh, so the process of determining the aircraft guidance actually shown um, uh, in this figure in the middle. So this uh, research was done for um, uh, sort of a preliminary assessment of a required aircraft uh, separation minimum um, with the knowledge of, um, in this case, the aer aircraft navigation performance. So in addition, our group also developed a UAM aircraft noise prediction tool. Um, so it's a, a bit, uh, you know, it's not about weather, but um, we, we, we developed this um, um, noise prediction tool for UAM aircraft called uh, Air Noise uh, UAM. So this uh, software tool was used, uh, used these rules and, and, and flight data we developed uh, for development of a noise exposure map uh, for UAM uh, following the FAA's uh, noise compliance uh, planning regulation. And next slide, please. Um, so it's recommended by ANCA, you know, her again, her is currently one of the most suitable weather portal for UMA application. We want to um, utilize this current weather data set provided by ANCA to understand its limitation and potential uh, for UMA application. So in this example, we compare her now cast data to forecast uh, that were made for you know one two and up to six hours uh, ahead uh, to see you know variation of weather variables in this letter uh, in this ex particular example uh, we look at DFW um, and we want to look at it uh, during you know different representative days um, so th this will actually help us better understand you know how applicable her is to strategic planning and um, also you know how um, this weather um, will impact you know uh, the UAM. Uh, operation, um, um, you know, also we are covering this with, you know, uh, different demand scenario um, 
that was uh, developed by Virginia Tech uh, for DFW Metroplex. And also, uh, in addition, we, uh, in the past, we, we heard people asking about how accurate uh, this, you know, the her forecast uh, product. So we, we so, so um, I think I'm going to skip here because, you know, this morning, I think there were some discussion on uh, really the um, how to uh, standardize, you know, uh, maybe looking at, um, you know, three tiers of uh, standard. Uh, to you know, to um, to define the requirement for you know the uh, weather observation and prediction accuracy and confidence level. Uh, so actually, so this uh, this work that I'm actually um, actually working on is somehow you know uh, I thought you know I, I have that similar question you know how uh, you know, how confidence you know, how accurate are these uh, weather products you know um, you know. Um, what are the uh, how are we going to make use of this? Um, even though sometimes you know probabilistic or uncertain uh, weather data information, you know, uh, in the decision making process. So I think and um, so I think I'm going to um, uh, skip over here. Um, and also, you know, the lastly, you know, um, we also interested in you know looking at you know how to quantify UM weather impacts using various um, uh, you know metrics. Uh, so in the past, I think for for the conventional air traffic, we we use VT light measure. But um, uh, the question that I have is you know uh, is is it, is it is, should we develop you know VT light measure for UAM type of aircraft or you know or whether you know we could still uh, or, or you know the other other metric. Um, is required. So, um, yep. So, uh, thank you for uh, time. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, thank you, yeah. Hawk. Um, and now we we'll go from. Thank you. Super thank you. from the research side over to industry. Beth is going to give us from an industry perspective some of the work they're doing. Hello, and I'm going to try to go fast. I won't talk in my wicked fast Boston talk, but um, I'll try to get us a little bit, uh, not too far over the top of the hour. So uh, I joined Collins back in January. Um, people may know me from the weather company. I spent 20 years over there. And, uh, you know, this is my first time working at an OEM, and they really touch many parts of the aircraft and um, have a lot of applications get into the MRO space. And it is no joke that sustainability is top of mind uh, throughout the organization and even as you roll up into um, the Raytheon capability um, connected ecosystem is where we're trying to put a lot of our focus and um, enabling digital transformation across the industry so we need to make it an imperative that as we meet the needs of our customers we're not compromising the environment for future generations next slide i won't go over this in detail but wanted to give an indication on colin's commitment um, to research and development on more sustainable technologies um, everything from, you know, engine technologies with greater efficiency to um, lighter materials on the aircraft to make them more fuel efficient as um, they're flying across. But if you hit it one more time, I think they'll highlight the bottom there. And um, this is the area that I'm going to focus on in the next couple of slides. And it's all around optimizing flight paths. And what we mean by that is um, looking at the best flight path trajectory both laterally and vertically um, in flight that way we can execute flights from their origin to destination um, in the most efficient way possible next slide um, and why why is this important why are we in this space i mean right now obviously reducing carbon emissions has become a huge focus over recent years but efforts in commercial aviation to reduce fuel consumption are not new um, airlines operate on slim margins fuel efficiency has always been a key focus of theirs a lot of that has been in um, flight planning um, and the fms were some of the major areas where that investment has been done um, but by the time the plane takes off the flight plan is old and um, the fms only provides a basic trajectory recalculation so uh, you know, the flight crews can make those requests to optimize the fuel and time, but it's often made with limited information. Um, and in recent years, we've seen a lot of biofuels, more efficient engines, improved aircraft design, but there's still much to be done in optimizing flight trajectories. Next slide. 
Uh, at Collins, we're working to build our, our flight, flight profile optimization, and really we saw the need for airline operations to have onboard decision support tools, but also to communicate back, um, to pull the dispatcher in the loop, because while the pilot um, does have ownership, the dispatcher also, at least in the United States, has 50% ownership of that flight, so they need to be collaborating together and making any of these um, decisions and, and routing around weather or um, and, and any of these um, optimization suggestions provided by the tool. Um, and, you know, there's also an EFF application component, but in the future, you know, we also hope to provide some of these through ACARS. So if you don't have connectivity, you'll still be able to provide these optimized uh, suggestions uh, to the pilot and, and into dispatch. And um, I mentioned already that it is key to do this both laterally and vertically, um, but there's also some components where um, we're focused not solely on a single aircraft optimization, but also from an ANSP perspective. So looking at capacity and doing multiple aircraft. And we do that by doing these calculations on the ground as opposed to uh, being on board and requiring equipment. There is no hardware requirements, although you know we can leverage information from AIDs and other um, information off of the aircraft. And um, Collins has a lot of uh, technology on board the aircraft for these uh, connected airplanes, but um, it is not needed to be done there. So you save a lot of compute power um, and you can get a lot of different information in there. Next slide. Uh, one of the products that go in here, and this is very similar to what we saw with Romeo, um, where we're taking different weather information from satellite lightning data and radar and creating some information around where the convection is right now on a global scale. Um, and this is really critical because as you're offering, saying looking at the winds or offering a better flight route, you're looking at what's happening in the airspace. Is this an approved route that I can even fly in? What's the rest of the traffic in the area? So if a pilot's going to ask for uh, the FAA for um, ATC to, to have that optimal route to take that, they also need to know that it's a safe route. So convective weather is a big part of that. So I'm liking um, the work that's been done in Romeo. And even in the contrail space, um, I think is that um, science improves. That could be something that you would put into an algorithm like this. Do you, uh, you know, optimize the flight route around contrails? Uh, you know, I don't think we're quite there yet with the, with the products that I've seen, but that could be a future place where we go. And I think when it comes to what weather we need to do this type of optimization and automate that, feed that into ATC and maybe automate that process in the future. So, you know, even not having to um, put a lot of manual effort on the pilot or dispatcher to, to work in that, but we need more high resolution information. Convective weather is a huge piece of that and not just in the U.S., but as, you know, we go out um, internationally um, for a lot of our customers are all over the world. Um, and I think that was all I had. I really wrapped that up in seven minutes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. There you go. She says respond, rapid response. <laughs> well, we got in our briefings close to on time and we went as quick. If there are questions now on any of these, I know some of the early ones probably are forgotten, uh, but if anybody, I know and everybody probably wants to go, so at least everybody got their briefing time. Um, any questions? Anybody have anything they want to ask? I guess if you yeah, raise your hand, you need a mic. So uh, on the NASA presentation uh, that dealt with the contrails in particular, I'd be interested to know if you're starting with the Schmidt-Appelman criterion or if you're coming up with something brand new. And then on the uh, presentation... Uh, we'll go one at a time if they're different people because that's okay. Hawk. Hawk well, that's the question. That? Did you hear that, Hawk? Yes, uh, I think, uh, right, the Appelman criteria. Um, um, yeah, this change to, to that, I think, I, I hear, I'm hearing some, hear some echo. echo. Yeah. So basically, uh, so the Appelman criteria um, provided the, um, the formation uh, threshold, but then I think there's additional um, uh, I think we look at the um, there's additional weather factors that um, needs to determine uh, the persistence, so-called persistence conditions. 
So uh, we look at the area that uh, favorable to not just the, uh, uh, you know, the, the control formation, but really uh, looking at area that will, uh, that the control once it form, we also precede. So I'm not sure if I, I understand that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I could you know I could provide you more information. Uh, so th this was the study that I think done um, more than you know six or seven years ago. Um, Go on. Anybody else? Well, I guess. Uh, yeah, one more. Got the green light. Can you hear me? So, on the present presentation from uh, UCAR NCAR uh, on what you were doing with the uh, satellite data, uh, so you're only using goes east and goes west. You know, generally satellite data, in particular in the northern latitudes, from uh, geostationary satellites isn't that good. The, uh, the you know the Air Force uses 31 satellites to cover the entire globe. Are you are you looking? To do more than that, are you going to incorporate the polar orbiters, or are you just going to stick with the ghost birds? Uh, for for the the two, there was a three satellite system for just the Romeo demonstration. The uh, products are being run with um, five satellites for global coverage, but we are not planning to use the polar orbiters for that yet. Um, I think that would require some more research, but it, it we do have a version of the products that are full global coverage, just not on the poles. Okay, well, then I suggest uh, you talk to the military because they have a global forecast system that does all that stuff. Yeah, we would be love to get more satellite data. <laughs> we would love that. <laughs> all right, Matt and Matthias, we are done and you can wrap it up. Yes, I've been told to be brief. Tomorrow morning, 0800, same place, same time, same virtual meeting uh, stuff. Be there, be square, drive carefully. Good night.